I thank the speaker. So, as my staff is getting a few things pulled together here, right now we're facing a critical question for our country, and it's a question about whether our country wants to be first or last. A lot has been made, obviously, of the former president's agenda, which he referred to as America first. Uh, and I think, unfortunately, I think maybe back behind here, we can do one there and there. Um, unfortunately, we're sitting here right now, and our country is now too often looking at America last. There are a number of issues that are facing the constituents that I represent, but I believe this is true for people all across the country. In Texas, I've spoken many times here on this floor about this. In Texas, our border is under siege. In Texas, it's a very real impact on our life, our communities. I share that with my colleagues from all across the country, all 50 states represented in here. It's very real in Texas, but it's very real in our country about what the impacts going on with the broken border. It's very real what's happening right now with people who run small businesses and need to hire people and they can't because we're paying people more not to work than to work. It's very real when people are going to buy gas at the pump and it's well over $3 a gallon. It's very real when they're trying to buy a house and lumber's up 470%. It's very real when they want to go get the health care of their choice and they can't. It's very real when they turn on the TV and they watch what was Middle East peace now turning into chaos as our friends in Israel are being attacked. There are consequences to our choices in elections. There are consequences to the leadership you have in your country. There are consequences to the decisions we make. And I would think that all Americans, regardless of which side of the aisle you fall, whether you're in Congress or whether you're back home watching, you want America to be first. You want America to succeed. You want America to do well. You want our allies to, to succeed. And here, as you see, I'm putting a comparison here of what world looks like America first, what the world looks like America last. We know a year ago, and admittedly we have the intervening reality of dealing with the pandemic, but a year ago, just over, we were dealing with record low unemployment, record levels of employment for minority communities in our country, a booming economy with strong economic growth, America leading and moving the world forward. And today, we've got jobs that are vacant, not being filled, small businesses coming up to me saying our whole livelihoods are getting destroyed, we're gonna lose everything we've built because I can't hire anybody. I go to restaurants and I see help wanted signs and they're struggling to have anybody there to serve. People are going back, it's not the virus, people are going back, they just can't get service. Every business person I talk to in the state of Texas faces the same dilemma, the same problem, they can't hire anybody. Now, why might that be? Could it be that in the infinite wisdom of this body that we have spent $6 trillion over the last year, $6 trillion over the last year, and that as part of doing that, we have funded unemployment at levels that is making it more attractive for Americans to choose not to work than to work? Americans are logical human beings. When presented with that choice, they're going to make that choice. Some aren't, but many do. And now you're owning a restaurant and you're trying to have wait staff or people to buzz tables or cooks, and you can't hire them. You're trying to run a landscaping company. You can't hire them. You're trying to run a cleaning business. You can't hire them. This is real, and it's happening right now in real time. And the result? An economy stagnating. We're not taking off with growth. Now we've got inflationary pressures because we just spent $6 trillion. You can run the risk of stagflation, low economic growth, higher cost of goods, all while we're now dealing with the uncertainty of a world in chaos. A year ago, small businesses were thriving. Small businesses are getting crushed. A year ago, not too long ago, gas was $1.77 a gallon. Now we're looking at gas over $3 a gallon. As I said, lumber prices are up 478%. Copper is up like 50 to 70%. I 
My parents right now are trying to go through building a house and they're not sure if the dollars that they've got set aside to do it are gonna work because all of these prices are going up, up, up at extraordinary rates. There's a cost to bad leadership and bad decision-making. Our border was well on its way to becoming secure. In April last year, we had 20,000 apprehensions. How many apprehensions did we have this year in April? 178,000. We've had over 530-something thousand apprehensions from January 1 through the end of April. We've had almost 600,000 apprehensions to date based on the information I have through mid-May. My sources at the border tell me that we've had 300,000 individuals who have gotten away or who have been released. I went down to the border, one of the many trips I've taken to the border, because the district I represent is about 150 miles away. And I went down at night and I met with about 50 different migrants who had just come across the Rio Grande. This was a group that I just met with and they're, walk, they're driving back down the road. I actually followed them in my truck with the headlights on so they weren't just walking in the middle of the darkness to go get over to where the processing center is. America First looks like this. Significant amounts of immigration, legal immigration hasn't dipped below a million per year in some 20 years. America's doors are open, y'all. The idea that people want to say, close our doors, that's, that's not the case. But you want to have operational control of your border. I'm going to talk about Israel in a minute. Israel put fences in place because they wanted to control their borders. And you know what? They worked. Of course they worked. We have fences in place in Southern California. Illegal immigration in the 1990s, which was astronomical, over half a million, dropped to 40 or 50,000. Why? Fences work. In Brownsville and McAllen, there's fences and there's infrastructure around Brownsville. There isn't in McAllen. Guess where the traffic goes? McAllen. This is not rocket science, but when you're putting America first, you put an infrastructure. Border Patrol wants it. They've asked for it. It works. Yes, some people will go around. Yes, some people will try to go over. But if you've ever spent a minute at our southern border, side note, I would offer to the Vice President of the United States that should you actually wish to do your job in supposedly running this whole border security task force, come on down to Texas. So far you haven't in the two months that you've been allegedly in charge, Madam Vice President. You could come see that instead of security, we have utter chaos. And here's the thing, these are human beings. These are not political pawns. These are human beings seeking a better life. I don't begrudge any one of these immigrants who are seeking to come to our country. God bless them. I tried to help any one of them that were coming across to figure out where they needed to go. They're human beings, all of God's creatures. But they shouldn't be endangered because we're sending up false signals that it's a good idea for people to be like the seven-year-old girl that I talked to on the border who was all by herself coming from Guatemala to America didn't have a parent, didn't have an uncle, didn't have an aunt, didn't have a brother, didn't have a sister. She was by herself. And the young man that was right next to her, I said, where did you meet this young girl? And he said, she, he said midway through Mexico. She was seven, y'all. Seven. We know that upwards of 20 to 30 percent, depending on which nonprofit, nonpartisan groups you listen to, of women that are on this journey get abused. We know that the cartels are making massive amounts of money moving human beings for profit. We know that fentanyl the most dangerous narcotic that's currently out there, or one of the most. We've now had more in 2021, in this calendar year, in four and a half months, than in all of 2020. Fentanyl. Our kids are dying. There's an opioid epidemic. And what does this administration do? Hey, I got a good idea. Let's have processing centers in McAllen. Let's have all the Border Patrol go down to McAllen and have to run processing centers instead of actually policing our borders between the ports of entry and trying to stop the flow of fentanyl and dangerous narcotics into our country. There is a consequence to not doing your job. This administration is not doing its job. This administration, worse than not doing its job, it's purposefully harming our country in the false name of compassion, instead of having secure borders, instead of allowing people to come to our country legally, safely, we're in danger immigrants and saying that that's somehow being compassionate. 
How's that compassionate? How's it compassionate when the Gulf cartel, the Reynosa faction of the Gulf cartel, is making millions of dollars moving human beings for profit? How is it compassionate when the cartel de Nareste of Los Zetas and Nuevo Laredo is making millions of dollars moving human beings for profit? When the district attorney in Kendall County, who, a county I represent, when Nicole Bishop, the district attorney there and I, visited and she talked about the nine illegal immigrants found in an automobile being driven by an American citizen employee of that cartel de Nareste, and had nine illegal immigrants in there, two tied up in the trunk, and they were being taken to a stash house in Houston, Texas, to be put into the human trafficking and sex trafficking trade. How is that compassionate? America first is about jobs, economic growth, a strong border, standing with our friends in Israel, affordable commodities like gas. America last is a wide open border in which Americans are endangered, ranches are overrun, cartels are empowered, immigrants are abused, Prices go up, commodity prices go up, businesses can't hire people, and we abandon Israel. America first versus America last. I've got more to say about this, which will surprise no one. But my friend from Pennsylvania is here, and I'd certainly love to turn the floor over to my good friend from Pennsylvania, should he wish to uh, opine. I would, and I thank the, the great gentleman from Texas, and, and I agree with him on the the position he's taken, America first versus this America last agenda. Now, I just, I'm from Pennsylvania, and people say, well, what do you care? You're a long way from the border. And uh, I will tell you, another great Pennsylvania is now running for governor, Lou Barletta. He was just a small town mayor in Pennsylvania, coal country, as far away from the border as you would have thought. But his, uh, his, tax, his tax base, he, he realized just over the course of a couple years, his tax base stayed the same, Chip. It stayed exactly the same, but his population, his little town, doubled. Mm -hmm. and, and, and the crime in his town doubled. He could no longer afford the police budget. And when, uh, and when a, one of the Latin kings, well, actually a gentleman, uh, one of the residents confronted a person who was a member of the Latin kings and said, stop selling drugs, trying to sell, sell drugs to my children. And that man pulled out, the, the gentleman, the, not a gentleman, cartel member, uh, Ill Ill illegal foreign national, illegal alien, pulled out his gun and shot that man right in the head, right there in the street. And, and that, that started this movement that illegal immigration, it's not even called, immigration is legal. It's not illegal, immig it's not immigration. This illegal crossing into our country, it's, it's, it's cultural piracy. It's piracy of our country, of our economy, of our safety. Um, and a lot of it was, uh, w the attention was drawn in a little town of Hazleton, Pennsylvania, because of Mayor Lou, and he said, I'm not going to stand for it, and I don't agree with the federal government's policies, and we're going to fight here, right here in, in our state, and end this craziness. And of course, they took him to court. The United States government fought their own citizen to put American citizens last, and these other folks first. Representative Roy, I just came back from the border, as you know. You live close to it. Mm -hmm. I go from Pennsylvania down to the border. Some things that, you know, you know are true, but you got to see them with your own eyes. And so maybe people don't realize it. They think, well, this is all poor, downtrodden, fearful people coming from Mexico or Central America. Two-thirds of the people that we saw coming across the border at that time, two-thirds were coming from other than Central America and Mexico. I got a news flash for everybody. They get, you can't come to Mexico with a one-way ticket, plane ticket. You gotta get a one, you gotta get your way in and you have to have a plane ticket to leave. So these people, they're come flying into Cancun, they're walking up to the border and they're discarding their go home ticket. Because if the border patrol catches them with that ticket, they can return them to that country. So they leave it right there at the border. These people are flying to Mexico to walk across our border. Two thirds of them. So the last people I saw, Chip, before I left that trip, the Border Patrol was detaining and processing, so to speak, Russian, Azerbaijan, and Cuba. All of them flew into Mexico to cross our border. And you know the other thing we found on the other side of the wall? Because as you talk about, and I know you have, the breaks in the wall where construction was stopped by the Biden administration, so you can walk right around the other side. 
not only all the little shoes, the little shoes of little kids yep. that they leave right. Th it's heartbreaking when you see those. I got children. You have children. Those little shoes. That's an indicator of all those kids that walk the whole way up to the border. But you know what else is heartbreaking? The package is a plan B left on the other side of the wall. You know what that's for, right? Because all these little girls and these ladies abused coming up to our border by the cartels. When I got there, of course, we watched people coming across the border and the cartel members are standing right on the other side, waving to us, giving us the old one finger salute, making a joke of all of us in this country and the people they just trafficked into this country. Is, is the gentleman aware that the vice president was tapped by the president to take charge of this crisis? I am aware of that. And of course, when I was there at the time, I think it was 44 days mm -hmm. since the vice president was tapped to take charge of the border. And of course, to, to your knowledge, has the vice president visited the southern border of the United States in the now almost two months that she's been allegedly in charge? Not, not to, unless it was a secret message, mission. Uh, does the gentleman agree, when we think about the various things that's impacting you, you represent constituents in Pennsylvania and I in Texas, you've talked about the reach of illegal immigration, narcotics, cartels, gangs into Pennsylvania. Uh, when we had the previous administration putting America first, does the gentleman agree that our economic situation and job situation and price of goods and services situation was far better and that small businesses were thriving versus today when small businesses can't hire anybody. Does the gentleman agree that commodities, gasoline, wood, housing uh, uh, supplies were cheaper and more affordable and today they're now skyrocketing through the roof after $6 trillion of spending? Does the gentleman agree that the border was becoming secure under an America First agenda and now it is wide open and being abused? Does the gentleman agree that we had historic Middle East peace uh, with our friends in Israel in, in making our country safer, by the way, in the process and holding the line against Iran and our enemies. And now we've got Israel under attack and an administration saddling up with our uh, stated enemy, Iran. Does the gentleman I, agree that I all do, of these are a stark I, contrast? I do agree. And by the way, while I, was, while I was at the border, individuals from Iran illegally entered the country. In four to five months in this country under this administration, we've gone back four to five decades in inflation, gas lines, illegal immigration, a wide open border. I mean, everything is turned on its head. Everything that was good about America five months ago is now turning the other direction just because of po these are policy changes. These are changes made in this House of Representatives. These are made right at the top by the president unilaterally destroying the opportunity for Americans, importing unskilled, unprepared labor, labor with, and they say to you, you know, one of the places we visited, Chip, was a food bank right on the border. Now, the, you know, people will say, you know, the Biden administration will say these illegal foreign nationals, these illegal aliens don't avail themselves to the public largesse. They don't get money from the American taxpayer. Meanwhile, they immediately got rid of the, you know, they wanted to get rid of the public charge requirement. If they didn't care about it, why was it such a big deal? But, but, but also, so your tax dollars go to the food bank. They don't necessarily go directly to the illegal foreign national. They go to the food bank. And then the food bank gives the money or the, the food to the illegal foreign national. So they are, they're, they're taking away opportunity. They're, they're uh, taking away the, the labor that Americans need for your first job. When, you're, when your child gets out of high school looking for the first job, when, you, when, when I was 13 and got my first job, I didn't have any skills, Chip. You know what I could do? I could show up on time with a good attitude. Yep. That's what I could do. Well, if somebody's willing to work for half price and show up on time with a good attitude, guess what? This American citizen doesn't get a job. And that's what's happening in this country in the last four to five months. I know, I know the gentleman has had, and I'll be mindful of your time whenever you, you have to uh, move, go on, but w would you agree that if you go back and say, all right, let's go look at how the America First agenda was performing a couple of years ago, that the unemployment rate in April of 2019 was 3.6%, that today the unemployment rate is 6.1%, that the poverty rate in 2019 was 10.5%, that the poverty rate today is 13.7% projected, that the consumer price index in April of 2019 was 2%, that today the consumer price index is at 4.2% and skyrocketing, that if you compare where we were with respect to energy, 
uh, a couple of years ago, and I know that my friend has a, has a heart for energy, and obviously it's very important to his state, as it is to mine in Texas, um, that for the, for under the uh, uh, Trump administration, for the first time in nearly 70 years, the United States became a net energy exporter. Right? Making right. us freer, stronger, with more abundant, more affordable energy. We became the number one producer of oil and natural gas in the world, ahead of Russia and Saudi Arabia. Natural gas production reached a record high of 34.9 quads in 2019, following record production in 18 and 17. The average American family saved $2,500 a year in lower electric bills. Now what do we have? A shutdown Keystone Pipeline. An administration saying we can't frack in Western lands. We rejoined the Paris Climate Agreement to have the United States foot the bill uh, put billions to the United Nations climate funds. We're suspended the leases on federal lands. Like I said, a complete federal land ban would increase foreign dependence by 2 million barrels a day. Gas prices are at a seven-year high. I could go on and on and on, but does the gentleman agree that there are consequences to an agenda like the previous administrations that puts the country first versus an administration that is perfectly fine putting the, the country last in, in order to go achieve some sort of, I don't know, fealty to the European social welfare state and make yourself seem, I don't know, uh, you know, welcomed in Davos. It does make you wonder, to the good gentleman from Texas, uh, who these folks that get elected to office represent. Do they represent their constituents, American citizens, or somebody else? You talked about closing the Keystone Pipeline. Well, what does that do? Does everybody think that we don't get any oil anymore? No, we just, we just pay more for it, right? We put it on trucks, we put it on trains, instead of through a pipeline. Somehow that makes us feel good. That costs us all a lot more money. And if you're not making much money, I remember the days, Chip. First of all, mm -hmm. I remember the days when I couldn't fill up my gas tank. You'd, you'd get five bucks and you'd make that last all week. And those were the same days where me and my boss, since I was underage, my boss, he pumped gas with a firearm on his hip because mm -hmm. they were e even and odd days. You could only get gas based on your license plate on an even or odd day because there wasn't enough and prices were going through the roof then and we're back into it now. At the same time, like I said, you wonder who's, who, whose constituency is this? Is, is this America first or is somebody else first? So they closed the Keystone Pipeline and then we talk about relieving sanction for Nord Stream 2. That's the Russian pipeline. Oh, well, I'm glad, we're, I'm glad we're happy to support Russia getting all the gas to where they want to get to their market, but apparently America is not allowed to do that. So whether it's inflation, oh, by the way, you don't see that happening either, well, as if it were true. There's nothing happening at the border, and inflation's not occurring. Go buy a two-by-four right now. Yeah, piece of plywood. Go buy a sheet of plywood, right? Yeah, exactly. You're paying $100 for a three-quarter uh, three inch sheet of plywood, and you're paying eight bucks for a two by four, yep. which with five months ago was two bucks. That's inflation. They can tell us all they want to that this agenda that they have works for America. We're Americans. It's not working for us. I was just explaining before the gentleman arrived that my parents are in the midst of building a house and you know they're beginning to wonder now whether or not they're gonna be able to afford this by the end of the bill because of the price of lumber, because of the price of concrete's going up. You've gotta have forms for the concrete and you've gotta have labor. And now we have a shortage of labor because we're paying people more to not work than to work. In the infinite wisdom of my colleagues on the other side of the aisle who believes that you can throw $6 trillion into the economy and not have consequence. Is the gentleman aware that it only took us $4.1 trillion in today's dollars to win all of World War II from beginning to end? Yet my colleagues on the other side of the aisle felt like it would be a good idea to dump $6 trillion into the economy and believe that it wouldn't have the consequence of inflation. It wouldn't have the consequence of paying people more not to work than to work, destroy jobs, destroy livelihoods, destroy small businesses. And now we see an, an, a America uh, first energy policy under the previous administration where we've had abundant oil, abundant energy. And now in America last, we've got lines. That's I mean, who's president? Is it Jimmy Carter? It, it's Jimmy Carter, Joe Biden. too, right? It's not only the, the third term of Obama, but it's the second term of Jimmy Carter. And we lived through that energy crisis. And we were told then, we were told then that we were running out of fuel. But that was yet another lie. And of course, now we don't have any jobs, right? Meanwhile, we closed down the Keystone Pipeline. How many jobs was that? And, and we're told that, uh, you know, you can go make solar panels. It's not America first. It's China first. Mm -hmm. those, those solar panels, all that what they call rare earth minerals, that's another fallacy. They're not rare. They're only rare in the United States because we're not allowed to get them because we have laws that preclude us 
from going to get them. It makes it cost ineffective. So we have to import them from China or other places. China does well. This is a China first policy, not an America first policy. This is coming from this administration and other administrations or acolytes to, that, to, those, to those themes, those, those policies. You know, I saw a photograph today that had a person uh, who was driving a Tesla. And God bless uh, Tesla and making technology and going, I'm all for it. But the, the person in their, you know, uh, virtue signaling self-congratulation of driving their Tesla is driving around with a license plate that says no fuel, right? Does somebody want to go, wait, hold on, knock on the door and say, uh, excuse me, uh, where do you think the power is coming from? Is it magic power? So you just pull somebody and say, well, we just get power from electricity. As if the electricity comes from nothing, right? As if the Tesla is just magically powered and suddenly just drives around without having abundant availability of energy. The gentleman aware and would agree with me that China has about 70% of the world's rare earth reserves and that when we're going down the road of solar panels and other uh, alternative forms of energy, and again, Texas embraced wind power, Texas embraced solar power, um, we can have these as part of our grid, but then what happens on a windless, cloudless, or cloudy day? Um, and you've got China being empowered. And one more question for the gentleman. Is the gentleman aware that we just saw a report that China uh, is producing more of the emissions and CO2 than the rest of the world combined. And so while they, my colleagues on the other side of the aisle want to tell us to join the Paris Agreement, which we were outperforming without being a part of it, they want us to bow down to the altar of the Chinese and say, oh, please let us be a part of this whole exercise while China is pumping out more pollutants, actual pollutants, and more CO2 than anybody else in the world. I, I am aware, and I thank uh, the gentleman from Texas for bringing it up. You know, we keep on hearing about getting to net zero, net zero carbon. What's fascinating is people don't realize that we could do that. If, if, we, if we actually did that, China would eclipse everything that we just did by going from our current economy to net zero in a, a few weeks' time, literally a few weeks' time. So we'd do all that, take ourselves back to essentially the seventh century, and China would eclipse it in just a few weeks' weeks time. First of all, there's not enough critical minerals, there's not enough mines, there's not enough mines on the planet to, trans, to transfer this energy economy into uh, a solely wind and solar powered economy. There's just not. And, and so we have to get real about what this is. And, and I think the pipeline shutdown uh, that you just saw on the East Coast here is indicative of how important and how tied to energy the vitality of this economy is and this America first agenda is. And, and, and tinkering with it, even just the slightest bit, has drastic consequences. My good friend, the gentleman from Texas, endured it. All of Texas endured it this winter. Yep. Their, their power got shut off. And the backup, the backup power for them, for their wind and solar grid, were pumps, were, were, were natural gas pumps. Unfortunately, they're electric powered. And they, the reason they made them power, the, the reason they chose electricity to power their backup pumps is to come below the standards, the emission standards. Well, guess what, ladies and gentlemen? When your electricity's off because the sun's not shining and the wind's not blowing and everything's frozen up, the electric pump doesn't work either. This is insanity. This is a, this, we're choosing this. We're doing this by design. Is the gentleman aware that human life expectancy, if you track it, on a chart, it's almost directly correlated to the availability of abundant energy, and that we have seen uh, the life-saving uh, advances that causes human flourishing, the ability to save people's lives, the advancement of modern me uh, technology for medicine, to be able to spread that around the world. And there's still three billion people in the world right now who are not living with abundant energy. And what do we want to do as the greatest country in the history of the world? We want to slam the brakes on this great economy with this magic unicorn dust of a, of a uh, view towards how we're going to have our energy policy while we throttle us back, empower China, allow China to be able to continue to pollute what they want to in the atmosphere. Meanwhile, human beings suffer. It's not, it's not only just allowing China to pollute at an unprecedented level. And maybe, you know, for people that don't like colonialism and right. think that America throws its weight around too much, maybe that's China's business, trying to lift... Mm -hmm. 
their impoverished people out of poverty and give them power. As you said, not just hundreds of lives, not just hundreds of, th hundreds of thousands of lives, but literally millions of lives will be saved with power. But what's the insult upon the injury is the Paris Climate Accord where we actually pay China. Yeah. We we'll take your tax dollars to take your energy away and pay them so that they can pollute even more while you can't live in the, 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 the first world, the 21st, the 21st century. That's, that's the insult upon injury here. I heard the gentleman uh, who um, I should note, thank you for your military service, your long career in serving in our uh, armed forces, and appreciate your service. I know the gentleman is concerned a lot about national security as well. With respect to pipelines, you alluded to the Nord Stream 2 pipeline. I mean, I believe today we learned that the administration was backing away from sanctions and is perfectly fine having the Nord Stream 2 pipeline funneling all sorts of, uh, of uh, uh, you know, uh, fossil fuels to Germany. But uh, forsaking our friends in Ukraine, by the way, in doing so, so you get a twofer out of this administration undermine our national security while harming our friends in UK, Ukraine, trying to push back against Putin. But oh, by the way, you're, you're, you're advancing a pipeline over there while you refuse to have pipelines in the United States of America. Yeah, we can't, uh, the gentleman probably knows this, but uh, Pennsylvania, of course, a great uh, energy state, has been for a long time, Titusville, the, you know, the Drake well and so on and so forth. It goes back a long time for us. We can't get our natural gas to market in New England because we can't get a pipeline through. They won't allow it. So where does New England get its natural gas in the wintertime when times are tough? They buy it from Russia. Talk about a national security issue. Again, more insult to injury. None of this is based on an America first agenda. It's, it's, it's almost like everybody else is first other than America. And these are, these are political leaders and policymakers elected by their American constituency, you would think, you would think that they would want to support that constituency first, do what's best for them, ease, ease their concerns when they got to make the bills, you know, pay the mortgage or, or uh, the gas bill or pay your, for your child's education and, and, the, and the prices just keep going up because of decisions that are made based on politics not based on efficacy and what's good for people in America. I know the gentleman you know, probably has things he needs to do, but before he leaves, I wanted to address one other issue on national security, because I know he's got a passion for this as well. Uh, we've talked about the impact on our economy of America first versus America last. We've talked about the impact on the border of America first versus America last. We've talked about the impact on energy uh, and availability of energy in America first versus America last. Now let's talk a little bit about the impact on the stability in the world, on Middle East peace, on our national security, and the national security of our friends and allies, and in particular, our friends in Israel. I know the gentleman, like I, has traveled to Israel. Um, I've been there a couple of times. I'm sure the gentleman's been there uh, a few times. Um, in my experience in Israel, uh, it is an extraordinary place with extraordinary people, with a pluralistic culture, a multi-faith culture, but it is a uh, burgeoning democracy a strong economy, and probably our strongest ally in the world, if not in the world, certainly in the Middle East. And the previous administration was doing what, for decades, previous administrations had said was impossible, and was striking historic peace deals with Arab nations, working, interacting with uh, Israel, with flights, direct flights from Arab nations to Israel occurring, uh, the Abraham Accords. We had significant peace in the Middle East. And yet, what do we have today? In a few short months, under the wisdom of the current administration, we have massive attacks on our friends in Israel. We have the massive loss of life. And God bless the previous relationships with our country and Israel to produce the technology that Iron Dome offers to the people of Israel so that they're not getting slaughtered by the rockets that's coming from Hamas, being supported, by the way, by the policies of this administration, in empowering Hamas to be taking shots at our friends in Israel, where our friends in Israel are under attack. Thank the good Lord above that we have Iron Dome and the ability to protect our friends in Israel and work with them so that we also have strong missile defense technology. Would the gentleman agree that that is the current state of affairs? This is, 
One of the saddest things we've seen in the few short months of this administration, the change from the Abraham Accords and uh, uh, the, uh, the, the lowering of tensions in the Middle East between these nations and the resolve to be peaceful, the great track that we were on in just a few, for, few short months, this is now, it goes from that picture to the picture with the rockets uh, being, being, and, and being sent to Israel, of course, being delivered, uh, the explosive being delivered by the technology produced in Iran, uh, by the avowed enemy of, uh, of Israel, Hamas, who seeks not to find some resolution, but seeks the death. It's in their charter. So if you don't like what I'm saying, you know, I'm just a messenger. It's in their charter that, that, that their job is to kill every single Jew. That's, that's what they seek to do. In just a few short months, everyone knew and everyone knows every administration will be tested by these, by these foreign adversaries. And this one's being tested right now. And of course, in my opinion, and obviously from the photographs, they're, they're, they're failing this test. And we just heard, does the gen is the gentleman aware that there's a proposal potentially coming to stop the, the sale of armament to Israel to rearm their missile defense system? I saw the same stories that my friend from Pennsylvania saw about some of our Democrat colleagues, I think here in the House and the Senate, who were starting to say that we needed to back off of that and not provide uh, the Hellfire missiles or any of the resources that we work in collaboration with our friends in Israel in order to make sure they're protected, and particularly in the use of Iron Dome, literally protecting millions of people, by the way. There's 150,000 rockets sitting in Lebanon, sitting and pointing right at northern Israel. And Israel, by the way, is about the size, the populated area in that northern part of Israel, it's about the size of a portion of the district I represent in that stretch between San Antonio and Austin. You know, I took a helicopter tour going up the Jordan, up the north side of Israel, back down to Tel Aviv and back to Jerusalem in a few hours. Can you, can you imagine, right? That's the size of Israel. And they've got 150,000 rockets in Lebanon pointing from the north. And they've got Gaza over here firing all of these missiles coming in from Gaza, Hamas, launching them in at Israel. And they are actually benefiting from the technology we're providing. And now you've got Democrats saying they want to uh, pull that away. Now, the good news is I also saw a story today with a couple of them starting to walk that back because hopefully they're starting to feel the pressure. The American people want us to stand with Israel. The American people want us to stand with our allies who stand with us. And that's what Israel has done. And I'd tell the gentleman, I'm sure he's experienced what I experienced when I was at the Sea of Galilee and I was on the floor the other night with Brian Mast, our uh, fellow veteran, uh, your fellow veteran, I should say, uh, who uh, lost his legs in service to our country. He also served two years in the Israeli Defense Forces. Well, Brian uh, and I were both sharing the story about when we were sitting on a pier in uh, at the Sea of Galilee, and the Israelis who were on that pier stood up and looked at us, and they all sang God Bless America, and they all stood up and thanked us one by one for what we do in defense of Israel and our partnership with them. And this administration is walking away from that. This administration is hugging Iran. This administration wants to cut deals with Iran, provide resources to Hamas in the Gaza Strip, which undermines Israel and undermines our national security. And the American people, when they know this, they don't want it. I, I, I will close with this. As I'm sure the gentleman has much more he'd like to talk about, and I've kind of interrupted him here a little bit, but no, I've so appreciated his work. Um, our relationship with Israel is much closer than just friendship. Uh, we depend on one another in, the, in so many ways that are unseen and unknown. Uh, and, and just one thing that had crossed my mind on many occasions, when you fly the most lethal attack helicopter in the world, the AH-64 Apache. Do you know you, something about that? You have a helmet system that is linked to the camera system, linked to the gun, that the placement of your head is followed by those cameras so you can fly the aircraft, is followed by that weapon system so that you can defend yourself at a moment's notice at all times. And that, that following that's done by the, with that helmet, which is very expensive, is made by our friends in Israel because we are together. Now, what breaks my heart, among other things, is that there are people right in this body, right in this body. I mean, I hate to say it, but they might as well be called the Hamas caucus. And I, and I, and I shudder to say that, and I, especially in terms of what I just said Hamas stands for the death of every single Jew in Israel. That's what they stand for, by, by their own accord, by their own account. That we would have people in this body say that Israel is an apartheid government and we should be supporting 
Hamas of what's happening, what they're doing, sending these munitions over. It's an insult. Arabs in Israel are the freest Arabs in that part of the world, right? They serve in government. They have their own political parties. They all have their own free speech in Israel. It's an insult. Is the gentleman aware that a few of our colleagues actually was, were lamenting, lamenting that Iron Dome was preventing casualties in Israel because for some reason that might be seen as disproportionate with respect to whatever uh, damage and casualties might be occurring in Gaza. And it seemed to me that the simple answer, I mean, I just color me crazy here, my friend from Pennsylvania, that the simple answer might be stop firing rockets from Gaza. Stop firing rockets at Israel. Israel or, would the gentleman also agree that our friends in Israel, the Israelis, call ahead, give them notice, tell them the missiles are coming in. They say, vacate the block, because in 15 minutes that building's going to be gone. And then we heard our colleagues on the other side of the aisle lamenting that somehow uh, AP or Al Jazeera were in a building that was taken out, yet there's ample evidence that they knew full well that Hamas was operating in that building, and they knew it, and yet they were doing it anyway, and they didn't care. Is the gentleman from Texas aware that Hamas routinely locates their firing batteries, their munition stocks, in schools, in populated areas with civilians, and fire from those locations uh, for multiple purposes, pr propaganda purposes? That's the, that's the depth of depravity where they would use small children as props even to have them killed in a response uh, as Israel defends itself, defends itself. This is all a response to an attack. Does the gentleman agree that Israel not only has a right to defend itself, and, and I was thankful to hear the president at least utter those words, that they have a right to defend themselves. Does he not uh, agree with me that they have a duty, a responsibility to defend themselves in the same way that we would if 1,500, or actually, you know, we're up to 3,300 rockets have been launched by Hamas in the last eight days. Can you imagine what the American people would be saying and doing if I was sitting in San Antonio or Austin and 3,300 rockets were coming at us from Nuevo Laredo, from across the border in Mexico? Would we just be sitting back and going, well, I mean, I wonder what that kind of proportionate response should look like. Or would you just be responding back with overwhelming force to say, under no circumstances do you shoot one rocket into our country, much less 3,300? That's the fundamental duty of those who take the oath and de of the Constitution. Defense. Defense of your nation. Defense of this liberty. And it can't be defended if it's under attack from a foreign nation. So absolutely, Israel has the right to defend itself and to respond to attacks. And again, it is abhorrent. It is completely insulting to refer to it as they do and to take the side of the aggressor in this regard and say that, well, the response is disproportionate. What is the proportionate response when, you're, when your innocent family is killed under the barrage of an unwarranted, unprovoked missile attack from across the, from across the close border? What is the appropriate response? If it were your family, I guarantee you, you would want a very robust stop, response to stop, to stop the missiles coming in. Uh, the gentleman's welcome to stay as long as he wants, but I think he has other places to go. But I would just say uh, I appreciate the gentleman joining me. I know he agrees with me that an American first agenda that is pro-jobs, pro-affordable uh, prices, pro-border security, pro-Israel, uh, pro-national security, pro-abundant energy uh, is much better than an America last agenda in which we abandon our uh, allies, abandon our own national security, have wide open borders, have skyrocketing prices, inflation going through the roof, uh, and uh, jobless, uh, joblessness because people can't find jobs because people are getting paid more not to work than to work. The gentleman from Pennsylvania does completely agree, and I thank the gentleman from Texas. Well, thank you, sir. I thank the gentleman from Pennsylvania. I would close a little bit here out on Israel by saying just a few things that I didn't get into in terms of the details, because this matters. These details matter. Um, I said before, in the last eight days, Hamas has launched more than 3,300 rockets at our friends in Israel. I mean, think about that. We've had 10 people in Israel have been killed, both Jews and Arabs. I read a story of a young Indian woman uh, who was visiting Israel, who was also, lo also lost her life. Iron Dome has intercepted 90% of the rockets. Hamas is trying to overwhelm the defense system and destroy Israel. 70% of Israeli civilians have run into a bomb shelter this week. Parents and children are being woken up in the middle of the night by sirens alerting them that they have 90 seconds to get inside a bomb shelter. We had um, 
Uh, Esther Schlesinger huddled uh, within their one-year-old son in a bomb shelter on Tuesday, and when speaking about the event, Esther said, I didn't have time to grab anything. I didn't have time to grab my phone. We just ran into the shelter and kept hearing explosion after explosion. She continued, I feel terrible for these parents who have to try and explain what's going on. I literally was holding my son in the bomb shelter tonight, thinking I'm grateful he isn't old enough to understand why I had to gr quickly grab him. Despite all this, she said, I don't doubt my decision to live here. Even in these crazy times, it is so important to me to be here as a Jew. We're seeing the result of a failed policy of this administration. Uh, when you think about it, President Trump called Prime Minister Netanyahu two days after his inauguration. The current president took over a month to call the Prime Minister of Israel, arguably our closest ally in the world, certainly our closest ally in the Middle East. Uh, when asked, President Biden's secretary couldn't even say whether Israel remains a, quote, important ally of the United States. The Biden administration has emboldened Iran, the number one state sponsor of terrorism, dedicated to the destruction of Israel in the United States by restarting negotiations on the failed 2015 Iran nuclear deal. They rewarded the PA by restoring millions of dollars in funding to the West Bank and Gaza, undermined Israel and international organizations by restoring $150 million in funding to the UNRWA and rejoining the Israel-hating United Nations Human Rights Council without much needed reforms. It's one hit after another, one punch to the gut after another to our friends in Israel while we're funding Hamas and their ability to fire rockets at our friends in Israel. This is a pattern, and I would just tell my friends on the other side of the aisle to ask yourself a question for the American people who are watching all of this, to say, do you want America to be first, or do you want America to be last? Because the current administration, the current policies of this body, the current policies of the Senate, are taking us down a road which we had long since left behind in the days of the Carter era, in the late 1970s, when you had Long lines at the gas pump, skyrocketing gas prices, inability to get jobs, stagflation, inflationary pressures. Most people today don't really remember. I remember when my parents got their mortgage rate down from 14%, 12%, 10%. Man, when they got to single digits, today those rates have been hovering around 3%. People don't understand what they're facing. And they're going to see it soon as they're seeing these prices skyrocket and they can't afford houses, and they can't afford gas, and they can't afford basic commodities and goods and services, and they can't hire people, and their small businesses are going out of business because of the policies of this administration. America first. People have jobs. Businesses thrive. Gas is affordable. Housing is affordable. Our border is becoming secure. A border, by the way, that still allowed people to legally migrate to our country, but to do so in a much safer way without empowering cartels to be able to move human beings for profit, put them into the sex trafficking trade, the human trafficking trade, make millions of dollars in the process. America First is putting our friends in Israel first and standing alongside of them for their interest, yes, but also for our national security interests. One or more two thoughts on the border because it's so close, hits so close to home in the state of Texas, which I represent. Now, I've taken multiple trips to the border and I've spoken about it many times here on this floor and elsewhere. But it's not just some esoteric concept that doesn't impact our whole country, but it certainly impacts Texas very directly. I said we had 178,000 migrants apprehended in April. We're now over 600,000 for the calendar year, 300,000 that have been released and or gotaways that have gotten into our country. Those are real numbers. They come from, so they're published numbers. Some of them are, uh, the gotaway numbers are numbers you get when you talk to people that know what's going on, who work in the DHS or work down at the border. April CBP numbers show more fentanyl seized in the first five months of 2021 than in all of 2020. Fentanyl is a dangerous narcotic. Do we not care? I mean, a legitimate question to my colleagues on the other side of the aisle, they literally not care. I've never once heard one of my colleagues on the other side of the aisle address this issue. Not once. 
I put something out on social media the other day telling the vice president that I'd be happy to meet her anywhere, anytime to debate the issue of border security. She's allegedly in charge of it. Well, Madam Vice President, I'm here on the floor of the United States House of Representatives, Article 1 in the Constitution. You're now serving in Article 2 as the vice president with a foot over in the Article 1 Senate as president. I'm happy to debate anytime, anywhere the status of the border of the United States and how it is endangering American citizens, endangering ranchers, endangering Border Patrol, endangering law enforcement officer, endangering Texans, allowing fentanyl and dangerous narcotics to flow into our communities, empowering the sex trafficking trade and the human trafficking trade, empowering cartels to be able to carry out their heinous activities. They just uncovered a burial pit just across the river, in the Rio, across the Rio Grande, where these dangerous cartels bury people that they murder, stories of people being locked into bars, chained doors in the building lit on fire, people being hung from bridges, people being burned alive. This is all happening literally across the Rio Grande. And we're empowering it. We're empowering it with an America last agenda where cartels are empowered, our borders are run by cartels, human beings are mistreated in the name of compassion. The American people are tired of all of the swamp drama. That's all we get here, swamp drama, every single day. We have more conversations about splitting us up by race. We have more conversations about January 6th commissions. We have more conversations about masks or not masks. Meanwhile, the American people are hurting. The American people can't hire people. The American people are dealing with wide open borders. The American people can't afford goods and services. The American people can't have their kids in schools without worrying about what's happening to their kids. All of the videos we're now seeing pop up with children testifying at school board hearings saying, I've been spending a year wearing a mask and I've been being yelled at and I'm being beat up because I'm being told, you know, I got to wear a mask and shut my uh, ability to see people. I want to see people's faces. What are we doing to our children? We're decimating a, general, a generation of Americans. American people are tired of this. We spent $6 trillion in the last year. You can't really make it up. What are we doing? I mean, with all due respect to the Speaker, Speaker Pelosi and the majority leader, and my colleagues on the other side of the aisle, what are we doing? We're destroying the American economy. We are killing small businesses. We are destroying our own dollar, our own economy. We're driving up the prices of goods and services. We're preventing people from being able to hire people. We're scaring the heck out of our children. We're allowing our schools to shut them down and not teach them. We're siding with our enemies in Iran instead of our friends in Israel. We're allowing wide open borders to endanger our people with fentanyl. We're empowering cartels. How on earth is the People's House allowing this to happen to the United States of America? The American people have had it. The American people want sanity. They don't want us talking about tweets and talking about all the drama in this town and what positions people have or don't have. They just want us to lead. They just want us to come into this body and not be here like I am right now by myself, with all due respect to the Madam Speaker, <laughs> but by myself addressing an empty chamber. But this is what debate has been reduced to, and I've talked about that before, but I'll keep talking about it. This is what debate has been reduced to. I chastised the majority leader earlier today because we were talking about a bill that was labeled a hate crimes prevention bill that came over from the Senate. And the majority leader said, well, you're either, if you're for this bill, you're against hate. If you're against this bill, you're for hate. And that's how that's going to be seen. And I told the majority leader, I said, that's the problem. I mean, is that, do you really believe that's true? 
that if I have a different view about how divvying us up by race is a bad idea and how categorizing us in categories of race and then creating thought crimes and having the government going around and policing our thoughts and go tracking us down based on what we say or do as opposed to, hey, you committed a crime. <laughs> but if I vote against the bill, oh, I, I'm for hate. That's what we've reduced this body to. And again, so, okay, I get it. These are political slogans to my left and right, right? There's a purpose to this. There's a purpose to me putting this up and saying America first versus America last. Okay. I would love it if we could sit here in this chamber and say, you know what? Maybe spending $6 trillion is a bad idea. Why don't we rewind some of those dollars and see if we can tone down that inflation? Why don't we tighten our belt a little bit? Why don't we get the dollars flowing in for unemployment that's crippling the ability of businesses to hire people? Why don't we pull that back a little bit? Why don't we just sit down at a table, roll our sleeves up, and figure out how to make it work? Why don't we say, hey, wide open borders being run by cartels is a bad idea. Let's figure out how to secure the borders. We're a sovereign nation. That's not a crazy thought. Why don't we say, hey, what are we getting out of our relationships with Israel and peace in the Middle East and standing side by side and the strength that that makes for our country and for them? Nearing the end of my time, and I've got a colleague over here that I believe is going to have a few thoughts to share, and so I'll wind down here in the next couple of minutes. I'll uh, alert my friend. Um, but I would just say, you know, first of all, let me just say, we don't say it enough, I appreciate the staff who uh, are down here and uh, keep this place running, and you have to sit here and stenographer, write everything down that we're saying, and, and you know, the clerks that keep everything going, and, and you're here because we're here, and I appreciate it. Um, as a former staffer myself, um, we very much appreciate you all being here. Um, it is an honor to serve in this body, but it is an honor because of what we need to achieve, not what we're doing. It is an honor to serve in the House of Representatives because of where this country can go, where it needs to go on behalf of its citizenry, not because of what we're doing today, because what we're doing today is undermining the health of this republic. And I'll just close by saying that one of the things that I've been talking to my constituents about when I go home is asking the very simple question is, are we free? Are we actually free? Are we free if we have $30 trillion of debt and we're undermining our economy? Are we free if people can't hire people in their small businesses in order to survive? Are we free if we have open borders that are being run by cartels? Are we free if we're not standing with our allies, but instead we're standing with some of our enemies? Are we free if China controls much of our supply chains? Are we free if the unborn never get a shot at life? Are we free if our children are being taught that America is evil in the schools? I would argue that we are not as free as we ought to be, that we're not as free as we need to be, and that we're not as free as is necessary to ensure that our kids and grandkids can inherit this great birthright of being an American citizen. I believe we should put America first. I do not believe that we should have America in last place. With that, I yield back. Gentleman, yields back. Gentleman